Well, good morning. My name is Shale, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm going to start off this morning with a question, not a trick question. Um, how many of you, by a show of hands, we don't really use this term anymore, but have a hobby? Something you do in your downtime. Could be golf, could be fishing. Anybody? Maybe I should ask who doesn't. That's probably more telling of uh, the people in the room. So admittedly, sorry, there's people in the back looking for seats. If you've got any seats next to you, just kind of help the ushers out a little bit. There we go. All right. Um, so admittedly, let's, I'm sorry, I got us off track. Um, admittedly, I don't have a lot of time these days. I do have, Jake always make fun of me that I refer to it as a day job, but I do have a day job. Um, and then there's stuff going on here, so I don't have a lot of time. But prior to having three kids and a lot of other things going on, I had a hobby, and it was photography. Um, anybody like photography? Um, now, I, I can't figure out how people do, like, the newborn pics or the family pics. I don't know how you have the patience to get people where they need to be. But what I, what I enjoy is, like, landscape photography, just seeing, like, a beautiful scene, like, just something. I, I think more specifically, I'm fascinated with pictures that make you want to understand what it would be like to actually step into the photo. Does that make sense? Like, you, have you ever seen a picture where you look at it and you're just like, man, if I could be right there experiencing the sights and the sounds and the, the smell. So I, I have an example just because I don't think a sermon goes by without a picture I show. But um, I took this picture in India a few years ago. And this, the second I took it, I was just like, man, I mean, again, I was in the photo, I guess. So I was there, but it's, it was fascinating to me as I look back on it, just to picture what was going on. This is in Delhi. There are 40 million people that live in Delhi. So it was an insanely busy highway that this was on. There were cars, you know, going past. There was rickshaws going past. And then out of nowhere, there's just these two guys on a cow or pulling a cart on a cow. And then the first thing I want to know is what's in the bags, I want to know where they're going. Like, I want to know what's happening. I want to know about the restaurant that's behind them. What kind of food does it have? How many of you would like to get and sit on the back of that cart and find out where they're going? Anybody? Now, does that say more about not wanting to go to India or what? I don't know what, I don't know what, what that says. But um, anyway, all right, let me, give, let me give you another one. Maybe this is more your style. So I, I saw this guy. It's also actually in India. But I, I saw this guy just riding his bike. In a more kind of reflective way, I was just like, man, look at him. I wonder where he's going. I wonder what he's doing. I wonder what his home life is like. I wonder what he's thinking right now. I wonder what his kids are like. Like Those are just some of the things that go through my mind. Is he happy? Is he sad? Like, I mean, I, I'm not trying to get like too introspective here, but those are just the type, I mean, pictures, can we agree that pictures have that ability if you let them? They, they can suck you in, you can, you can look at them. All right, here's another one. I should just, just listen to the reaction to gauge if you actually like the photo or not. So wouldn't you like to just climb on one of those boats, push out into the water? This was in, in the mountains. So it's just, you can picture the air, the smell, the cleanliness. We don't get good smells in Florida. You can just picture, like, breathing in that deep, crisp air. All right, here's another one. How many of you would like to get on a bike and ride down that hill and see how far you can go? Anybody? Does anyone understand the significance of this picture? Forrest Gump, I heard it over here. So this is actually where Forrest Gump stopped running, all right? That's not why I liked the photo. It's mile marker 13. You can see the 13 mile marker on the left. But that's actually what that's, that picture, why I took that picture. All right, how about this one? Ballast Point. Anybody ever been out to Ballast Point? So this is in Tampa, South Tampa, down closer to the bay. It's early morning, like just going out. Can you imagine going out to the end of the dock Sitting there, smelling the salt water, hearing people fish. Like, like, can you agree that pictures, if you let them, have that ability? All right, I got a couple more. Central Park, Christmas time. Anybody? No? All right. Like, there's just, there's something about it. All right, last one. So, 
I took this in Wisconsin. I actually pulled over to the side of the road. I was going to see a client, and I pulled over to the side of the road. I was like, I got to take a picture of this church. Like, it just looks so amazing to me. So I did. I took this picture. Then I walked up to the door. I really just wanted to see if, if it was still operational, if things were happening, if it was still a church, or if you know, it was a museum of some kind. A lot of these are just turned into other things, these old churches. And it was still a church, but there was a plaque on the wall that said it commemorated their 100th anniversary of being open. Now, I want you to kind of transition this to the spiritual side. I want you to think about how many people in those, I mean, we're talking generations upon generations of people. Think about how many people gave their lives to Jesus inside those walls. Think about the stories that could be told. Think about the weddings. Think about the funerals. Think about the baby dedications, the laughing, the crying. We're talking a, a hundred years. And so I actually have this as one of my backgrounds occasionally on my computer. And I just, as soon as I see it, that's where my mind goes. I'm just, I'm trying to figure out, maybe it's just the pastor side of me. I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the lives of the people. What's actually going on in the hearts of the people? Are they walking with Jesus? Are they, are they not walking with Jesus? And oddly, I, some of you think I'm weird. A picture just has that ability. Like if we allow it, we are drawn to some photos. We are repulsed by others. There, there are some photos that just, they, they give us joy in our heart. They just get us going in our hearts. And then for others, for some reason, the same picture might bring anxiety and fear. And, and I've actually tried to read about this to figure out why that is. If it's a connection to childhood, if it's a connection to a vacation, like, like what causes like what caused certain ones of you to say, oh, I don't want to go there, and others you'd be like, I would love to go there. Like, what is it? And so I, I like to read a lot about photography just to see. And one of the things they say is when you're taking a picture of a forest, like a, a, like a deep amount of trees, it can be beautiful foliage. I mean, it can be the most beautiful forest you've ever seen. But when you take a picture of a forest, you have to find an angle with a path. They said, psychologically, people need a way out. No matter how beautiful the forest is, you have to take a picture of a path if you actually want people to like the photos. And they, they said that if, they've actually done studies where they take a, a picture of a forest and they have the exact same vantage point. Someone is standing in the exact same spot taking a picture of the same thing. And they said they show picture people a photo, a picture of just the trees. And then they move it over just a little bit and they show really the same vantage point, but this time it has a path. And they said, on the one hand, to whoever's taken the study, the one always brings anxiety, and the one with the path always brings peace and calm. It, it, I mean, it's kind of crazy, but it's all in the way the photo is viewed. It's the exact same thing, but it's the viewpoint of the person looking at the photo. And I, I, I say all that because I think there's a spiritual element to that. Like, if you think about your life for a second... And you think about those times where life, let's just, let's just make it a forest, you know, for the sake of the, the argument here. If, you, if you're in a trial, if you're in a setting where things feel like it's unescapable, it's tough, there's nothing you can do, you're in the midst of darkness, what do you want? You want a path. You want light. You want an escape. You want to be able to get out. That, that's just the way we are. That's human nature. That's how we all are. Let me, let me ask you a question. How many of you enjoy walking through trials? I take it by the laughter, not many. Okay, how many of you, some of you may know where this is going. I'm going to come back and get you on this later. How many of you would say you, have, you find joy in trials? Honestly. You find joy in your life when you're going through trials. The Bible actually says that trials are a good thing. Many different places. We don't have the time to read them all. But the Bible actually says that trials are a good thing. They're an opportunity not only for growth and an opportunity not only for maturity, but more importantly, if they are viewed from the right perspective, if they are viewed the right way, they deepen our faith and they deepen our trust in the Lord. And that's what we're going to study today. If you have a Bible, open with me to James chapter 1. We preach through books of the Bible, verse by verse, book by book. Last week we started the book of James. We'll be in James probably till September would be my guess. Um, last week, Wes covered one verse. So we're going to go a little further today. We're going to cover three verses. I'm actually going to recover verse 1 because I, I just think there's a, a lot there in verse 1. But one of the questions, you, if, if you allow it, one of the questions you're going to leave with today is how do you view trials in your life? 
That's the question. How do you view trials, and what do you do with trials in your life? So if you have a Bible, open to James chapter 1, and here's how it starts. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. So a a couple things about this verse. Can we leave that verse up there? A couple things about the verse that I, I think are super critical to the verses we're actually going to cover today. First of all, the author of this letter, as he states right at the beginning, is a man named James. This is the half-brother of Jesus. I realize that might sound a little strange. We talked about it last week. But at some point after the virgin birth, Joseph and Mary went on to have other children, many other children, and James was one of them. One of the reasons I point that out, I mean, first of all, I just think it's fascinating, but one of the reasons I point that out is because I believe James offers a very unique perspective on what we're about to study. I, I think he, you know, if you look at all the biblical writers, especially the New Testament writers, even though everything they write is Holy Spirit inspired, it's all inspired by God, a lot of times they're bringing their own viewpoints to the story. Like Matthew writes in a certain way. Mark writes in a certain way. John writes in a certain way. He's covering certain things. So a lot of times they're doing that. I think James brings a lot of perspective to the table. If you think about it, he grew up eating at the same table as Jesus. They were kids together. He shared the same house. He played the same games. They did chores together. They laughed together. They worked together together. James literally watched his older brother, Jesus, his entire life. It's also probably why he was a little skeptical of Jesus when Jesus first started his ministry. I mean, probably not because, well, not, I shouldn't say probably. Not because Jesus gave him any reason to doubt who he was, but you have to admit, it'd be a little hard for your brother to convince you that he's God. Right? I mean, that's, we know he was, but, it, you know, I'm thinking of my siblings it would take a lot of convincing. But the, so the Bible actually says, and again, Wes covered this last week, that James and we believe the rest of the siblings were really skeptical of Jesus in the beginning when he was doing his ministry. They're like, we don't even get the sense that they were with him a lot of the time, that they were following him. But at some point after the resurrection, that changed. We see in Corinthians that Jesus actually appeared to James in the 40 days between the cross and the ascension. So I don't know what kind of conversations they had. I assume everything got worked out because now you fast forward years later, James is a leader in the church at Jerusalem. I have to imagine that he is writing, as he's writing this letter, he is writing from years of conversations, years of things that he's wrestling with in his head, things that he and Jesus had discussed. Like it's blunt, it's direct, it's from the heart. And he's writing, as you can see from this verse, he's writing this letter to Christians, most of whom have a Jewish background. You could tell that by the 12 tribes. That would be a Jewish, that would be noting Jewish people. So he's writing to Christians, most of whom have a Jewish background. And you can see he says to 12 tribes in the dispersion. So they are are scattered all around the Mediterranean. Now, the word dispersion, just, you know, you can kind of guess what that means. It means dispersed. They, they, are, they are scattered around. And, and I want to paint a picture for a second on what happened in the dispersion because I, I think it's very relevant to where we are when James picks up his letter. So the dispersion actually started. We'll get a little bit of history here. You have to rewind back 800 years to the Old Testament to kind of get a sense of when this dispersion started. All right, if you think of the promised land where Israel was, the Jews came out of Egypt through the 10 plagues. Remember Exodus, they're leaving that area, Egypt. They're coming into the promised land. A lot of things happened. Joshua was leading them at one point, and then they finally settle in the promised land, the land that was promised to Abraham and Jacob, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They settle in this land, and they lived there for hundreds of years. They lived there through the judges. They lived there through King Saul. They lived there through King David. They lived there through King Solomon. But after King Solomon, the kingdom of Israel split. It split into the northern tribes and the southern tribes. And in 722 BC, the Assyrians came into the north and they took captive a whole bunch of the Jewish people and they took them back to their homeland. 
And then about 150 years later, the Babylonians came in, and they came in and invaded the south, and they took a bunch of captives back to their homeland. If you've ever read the story of Daniel in the Old Testament, remember he came in and got taken captive. That was by the Babylonians, and he was being taken back to their homeland. So that really started the dispersion. That started the scattering of the Jews out of the promised land into all these different parts of the ancient world. Now, Jerusalem was rebuilt, and it was rebuilt in Ezra and Nehemiah, if you read those books. And it was rebuilt, but not a lot of the Jewish people came back. Some did. So when Jesus comes, and Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament, he does his ministry, he dies on the cross, he raises again. A lot of the Jews were kind of scattered all over to different parts of the world. So that's kind of what James is referring to. But if you think of after the ascension, the church is growing. Things are happening. You know, you see the early part of the church in Acts. You see all the different stories that happens. But there's one really key point that that I want to highlight because I I think it's important to verse 2. If you go to Acts chapter 7 and 8, there's this guy named Saul. Eventually he would become the Apostle Paul. But at this point he's just called Saul. And you're getting a sense of how much the Jews hated the Christians. They kind of look at them as traitors. Why would you leave the Jewish faith? Why would you profess faith in Jesus? So the Jews and the Christians, I mean, the Christians, I think, were fine with them, but the Jews wanted nothing to do with them. And you see that in Acts chapter 7 and 8 with Stephen, the first martyr. Saul actually has him killed. And here's what we read. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul approved of his execution... And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered, dispersed throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. So here's why this is important. Even though the the Jewish dispersion actually started 800 years earlier, the group of people that James is writing this letter to are in a very, very unique situation. In a sense, if you want to kind of contextualize it for us today, you would consider them refugees. They have no homeland. They really have nowhere to go. Nobody's accepting them. They are Jewish by heritage but they are not allowed or accepted inside the Jewish community because of their belief in Jesus. Wherever these early Christians went, they were outcasts. They had no rights. In fact, one scholar says their standing in society was less than that of a slave. They had lost jobs. They had lost property. I mean, think of where you are today. You're, you're building something. You're growing something. You probably have a job. You're, you're, you know, you're trying to get to retirement. There's all these things you're working for. Imagine that you, you profess faith in Jesus one day, and all of it is taken. It's really not that far-fetched that it could happen at some point. But imagine that. That's, that's what they're experiencing. All of that is just taken from them. Everything they've been building their entire lives is gone. Like, like think about the implications of that for a second, because I want you to personalize this. Imagine a father not able to get a job and support his family. Nobody will hire him. Imagine a mother with no way to keep her kids safe. Children, they've had to pick up and leave. Children dealing with new surroundings, uncertain futures. Families were isolated. In a lot of cases, they had no relationships with other relatives because they were shunned. They were alone, struggling with how to live out this new faith. Like this is all very new to them, struggling to how to live this out. So imagine being in their shoes, these people's shoes, and getting a letter from the church at Jerusalem that was written by a leader in that church. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this is the very first New Testament letter that was written, probably written in the 40s, 40 AD, mid 40s, somewhere around there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, probably wouldn't have been written for another 20 to 25 years. Paul, at this point, hadn't even gone on his first missionary journey. This is how early we are in the New Testament. They didn't have all these other books to encourage them by. They couldn't just pick up the letter to Colossae and the letter to Philippi and the letter to Ephesus and say, wow, we get all this kind of encouragement. This is how we should live out our Christian faith. Like, I have to imagine they are just scrambling, trying to figure out what to do, what does life look like, and now imagine getting this letter from Jerusalem, from James, 
and you're, wow, I mean, I can only imagine the excitement they would have had. They gather everybody together. They come in. Somebody runs in, holds up a scroll, and says, hey, we got something from Jerusalem. Now, now let me ask you a question. If you were writing the letter to these people, knowing what they're going through, knowing what they're feeling, what would you say to them? Think about it. I try to think of what I, I try to think of how we just generally encourage people. Don't worry, it's going to get better. You know, I, you got this. I'll be praying for you. Keep your head up. Can't get any worse. You know, every, things are eventually going to turn around. I mean, just think of our normal, you know, vernacular that we use around encouragement, right? But they take the letter, they enroll it, they read the first few words. Can we put verse one back up on the screen? They read these first few words and they're like, wow, this is from James, the half brother of Jesus a son of Mary. Now, obviously, the Catholics weren't around then, so I don't know that Mary was held in the regard that she is by that religion today. But imagine, I mean, this is the, a son of Mary, a half-brother of Jesus, and he is writing us a letter. And here's what he says. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. That's not what I would have expected to read. Right? Talk about a mind-blowing statement. Imagine reading that first sentence. Like, I, I have to imagine you could have heard a pin drop. People looking around. If I was reading the letter, I probably would have stopped. I'd have been like, really? Joy? Does he, does he not realize what we're going through? Does he not realize what's happening? Are you sure this is from the right James? Like, that's what I would have asked. Are you sure this is that James? Like the James in Jerusalem, the leader of the church? Because, I, I mean, think about it. Forget, forget that for a second. Think about your life. Think about a trial that you are going through personally. Picture yourself in the middle of a trial. How's your mood? How's your demeanor? If you're anything like me, joy ain't nowhere to be found. If you're anything like me, that's the farthest thing from my mind. Am I the only one? Can I get an amen? I mean, I'm not saying that's the right way to view it. I'm just saying that's generally how we are. Like maybe I could find some good in a little trial. Just give me a little curveball, God. A little one that I can still hit. It's not that far out of the strike zone. Just a, a little tiny curveball. And then, but notice James doesn't give us that out. He says various trials. It's almost like he doesn't want you to think that your trial is not the same as somebody else's trial. It's almost like he wants you to think and me to think that your trial, okay, well, you can't have joy in that trial. It's everything. This word various in the Greek is all-encompassing. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Do you think he's talking about financial issues? Probably. Do you think he's talking about being sick? Do you think he's talking about the death of a loved one? That, that would certainly be a trial. How about difficult marriages? Yeah. How about persecution? Probably what these people were going through. Absolutely. How, how about struggling with singleness or infertility or relational issues? Do, do you think that's included in this trial? Let, let me just be clear. There's no out. That everything is included. Essentially, what I want you to see is what James is saying is when life throws you a curveball, count it all joy. Does that sound incredibly difficult to anyone else besides me? Like, like what on earth could he possibly mean to consider it joy? And, and I think the answer starts with the very first word. Notice the very first word in this verse says, consider. Sometimes the hardest thing to do in a trial is consider anything except getting out of it. Sometimes the hardest thing to do in a trial is to actually stop, look above your circumstances, and wonder what else could be going on here. But most of the time, we're just so obsessed with what we're going through. He start, I mean, if, think about it this way. If you consider something, like consider a job offer, I'm, I'm talking kind of petty things here, but you consider a, a job offer or maybe something bigger, like who you're going to spend the rest of your life with, if you're going to marry someone, if you're going to buy this house. I mean, all these different things that we consider, the idea is you are processing it. The idea is you are contemplating, you're pondering, you're reflecting, you're giving it deep thought. And it would seem that James is telling us to do the exact same thing with our trials. He is telling us to view the trials in our lives through a very specific lens. 
And I think part of the issue with that is that a trial, by its very nature, is overwhelming. A trial, by its very nature, is all-consuming. We wake up, we think about it. We go to work, we think about it. We drive to work, we think about it. We come home, we think about it, right? It is all-consuming. It's like the only thing that's on my mind, and he's like, look, you have to do something very different. The, the, really, I think the encouragement from James here is to renew our minds, like Paul tells the church at Rome. It's the renewing of your mind to think of trials differently, to consider that there might be something bigger going on here, even if it's of your own doing. You did something stupid at work and you got fired and it's your own doing. It doesn't mean God can't use the situation. It doesn't mean that there's not something bigger going on there, that God can't use your trial and your situation for your good. How is it possible? Look at verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. But endurance must do its complete work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So that word testing, the third, fourth word there, knowing that the testing of your faith, that, that word testing that James uses in the Greek, it, it's, it's a little unique. It's actually the picture of a refiner walking through the process of turning a raw material into a precious metal. And historically, the refiner would build a fire. They would get it to just the right temperature. Obviously, there were no thermometers in that day, so it took someone who was very skilled at doing this. And so they would, they would get this fire going. They would get it to right the exact temperature. And when it was right, they would get the crushed ore. They would place it in the melting pot. And all of a sudden, some of the, the, the dross, as they call it, the impurities, would rise to the surface. They would soften, it would rise to the surface, and they would scrape off the impurities, and then they would repeat the process. They would turn up the heat a little bit, more impurities would come up, they would scrape those off, and they would do that process over and over and over again until the silver was pure. And one of the reasons the person who was doing this, the refiner, one of the ways they could tell if the metal was ready is the refiner would look into the pot and, his, and the, the goal was to see if they could see their own reflection clearly. As soon as the refiner could look into the pot, they could see their own reflection, and it was clear they knew the silver, in this case, was pure. So part of what James is saying is that trials provide us the opportunity for clarity. Not necessarily mental clarity, but clarity in our faith, clarity with God, the ability to walk closer with God, like spiritually mature throughout that process. Psalm 66 says it like this. It says, for you, O God, have tested us. There's that same word. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. You don't have to raise your hand, but let me ask you a question. How many of you right now are going through a trial? I would assume it's most of us in the room. It could be big, it could be small, it doesn't really matter. Let me, let me ask you a question. What is your goal in the midst of the trial? Is there, is there a goal for you in the midst of the trial? And if you're anything like me, I, I'm, I'm trying to get you to look at trials differently because God's been trying to get me to do that for like three weeks now as I've been studying. If you're anything like me, your goal in the trial is to do literally anything you can do to get out of the trial. I don't want anything to do with it. It's an obsession. It can totally consumes my mind. It's the focus, even if I do have a spiritual aspect to it, it's the focus of all my prayers like an obsession. And don't hear me. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be focused on it. You shouldn't be praying for it. You, I, I get that. I, that's, that's not what I'm saying. But for me, it, it's an obsession to get out of it as quickly as I can. And I mean, I, I get that. I think we all can probably resonate with that. But what would happen if we looked at the trials in our lives, whatever they are, and we said, Lord, more than anything, I want to know you during this time. I don't know how long it's going to last. I don't know how much more pain I'm going to be in. But more than anything, I want to know you during this time. Think about that. Let me ask you another question. What is your relationship with God like in the midst of your trial? Is it better? Is it worse? Which can often be the case. You're like, God, how could you ever let this happen? I'm, I'm out of here. Like that clearly can be the case. 
So is it better? Is it worse? Is it maybe non-existent because you're just so obsessed with what you're going through? How about this? Would you embrace the trial if you knew it would bring you closer to Jesus? That's a tough one. Trials aren't fun. But would you embrace the trial? Would you embrace the next trial? Lord, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know what this is going to look like, but I'm going to embrace whatever it is if it brings me closer to you. Because ultimately, we find joy in trials when Jesus is the result. That is the only way, humanly speaking, to find joy in trials. It's when Jesus is the result. And you know what's interesting is as I, as I think back over my life, it, it's not necessarily the, the good times where my faith grew. I, it's not the, the celebrations and the happiness as I look back where my faith grew the most. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm grateful for those times and I love those times and I thank the Lord for those times. Like it's, it's absolutely amazing. But if I'm honest, some of my deepest growth that the closest I got to Jesus happened in the absolute darkest moments of my life. Can anybody relate to that? Like, it, it's, that's just the way it happens. And I think it's because it was, it was moments where I was at the end of myself and I realized I got nowhere to go. I've done all the things I usually do. I've tried to control the situation like I normally do. I've done all this. I've called all these people. Like whatever it is that I've done, I'm at the end of myself. But thankfully the Lord's like, it's about time. You're at the end of yourself. You're looking to me now. And he was there. And ultimately I realized he is the one that was carrying me through. I didn't get through it. He was the one that was carrying me through. And here's the deal. When you experience that, your faith grows. You're quicker next time to turn to the Lord. Why didn't I do that earlier? Why did it take me a year and a half to do that? You're, you're quicker to all of a sudden, you're like, whoa, 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 I got, I got to turn to the Lord. And then you, you do that, your faith grows, and faith, as James says, produces endurance. It's a process. And as we endure, it's, it's not so much that we become stronger, because it's all about him. It's the fact that as we endure, we rely on him more. We realize how weak we are. We decrease, he increases. We're quicker to go to him. We're quicker to get on our knees and pray. We're quicker to just hand it to him. And when you're first starting out in this process, I mean, for me, it took months. I'm gonna do everything I know to do to fix this situation. God's just sitting there. I mean, he probably wasn't just sitting there. He's still orchestrating circumstances like God does. But that, that, that's, that's the, like the more we do that, the more we endure, the more we rely on Jesus, the more mature and complete we are in Christ. Now, unfortunately, the flip side is that we don't persevere to trial. The flip side is we don't run to Jesus, we run away. The flip side is, actually, let me say it this way. If I, if I go back in my life, I don't know, 15, 16 years, I always get the dates wrong, but sometime in the past when I wasn't walking with Jesus, anytime I hit a trial, anything bad happened in my life, I would run as far from Jesus as I could. It wasn't because I didn't want anything to do with Jesus necessarily. It's just because I didn't think he could pacify. So something would come up and I would run to the bar. I'd run to girls. I'd run to clubs. I'd run to sports. I'd run to you name it. You fill in the blank. I am running to whatever I can to pacify my heart. At the end of the day, that's what we're all looking for. We're looking for peace in our heart and a smile on our face. And the problem half the time is we just don't know where to get it. And Jesus is like, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Everybody in this room, that's our, that's our human tendency. Trial happens, am I going to go to Jesus or am I going to go the other way? It may not feel like you're going the other way, and you may not say you're going the other way, but your actions tell the story. If you're in the word more, if you're praying more, if you're seeking him, I mean, your actions tell the story. And it's just, like, like, it's, like think about it this way. I see this all the time. I used to see it a lot when I worked with college kids, and that's the exact same way I was in college because I just, I wasn't, I didn't quite grasp what God was doing at that point in my life. But I would work with college kids, and a kid would come in and say, man, I broke up with my girlfriend. God doesn't love me. And, it, you know, you can kind of chuckle about it now, but we have this assumption. When I first started walking with the Lord, you don't want to know the life I came from. 
You don't want to know the nonsense I was doing when Jesus rescued me. And so I remember walking with Jesus. I've been walking with Jesus for, I don't know, three or four months. And I hit that first trial, that first real trial. And my immediate response was, what are you doing? I'm obeying you. I'm walking with you. I stopped doing all that nonsense. Like, I don't understand why good things aren't happening. Well, what I didn't understand is a trial is an opportunity. A trial is a moment. God is drawing me to him. He is saying, no, 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 no. It's not an opportunity to run away. It's an opportunity to run to me. And and over time, I realized over a long time, I realized that that is when my relationship grew the most. It's, but unfortunately, when trials happen, we just say, I'm out of here, I'm not doing this. And, and maybe we still show up, but if we're honest, inside we're changed. We don't trust God like we used to because that trial kind of scarred us a little bit. And God's like, just come to me. I'll help with the scars. We'll, we'll walk through this together. And, and, I, and I feel like, you know, for me anyway, we live in America, we have freedoms that a lot of the world doesn't. We've got security. We're one of the richest nations in the history of the world. I mean, so there, 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 I think there's just this propensity to believe that we shouldn't experience trials. I'm not saying we would say that, but you know, we can insulate ourselves pretty good. Right, we can get really good health care. We can have a big 401k. We can have a big bank account. We, we can kind of weather the storms that a lot of people in this country and out of this country, they go through. And so I feel like in some cases, all of a sudden a trial hits and then we're just like, same thing. What's going on here? But, but James is telling us, look, a trial is not the heavy hand of God coming to pound you because you did something wrong. It's an opportunity to run into the arms of a loving, caring father. And that's what James is saying. That's what he's challenging us to do. He's encouraging us to stay strong because he knows our tendency. And in verse 12, I'm going to skip down to verse 12. We'll cover this in a few weeks. But I think it kind of bookends this section well. In verse 12, this is what James says. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast, endures, under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. There's something much bigger at stake than just whether or not I have a good attitude during the trial. There is eternity at stake. There, there is, he says, you'll get the crown of life. I don't want you to picture a crown like a king's crown with jewels on it. It would have been more like a wreath that the, you know, the ancient athletes would have worn. Paul has this imagery in 1 Corinthians 9 that I think is beautiful. It's one of my favorite verses. This is what he says. He's kind of picturing this same scenario. Paul says, do you not know that in a race... All the runners run. We're all, we're all in a race. We're all headed in a direction. We're all going somewhere, but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Go hard. Drive hard. Push hard. Like, don't let trials get you down. This is the idea that Paul is saying. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, as followers of Christ, we do it for an imperishable So Paul says, I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body. I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. That word disqualified at the end, it's the same word that the silversmiths would use to describe silver that wasn't pure. It would be disqualified. Like occasionally, if you think back to that process, they turn up the heat, they'd scrape off the impurities, they turn up the heat, they'd scrape off the impurities. Occasionally, they just could not get the impurities out of it. No matter how high they turned up the heat, the impurities wouldn't release from the silver, and that silver was considered disqualified. That's the picture. And that's a scary place to be. Can we agree? And so my hope for us this morning is that we would, we would recognize that sin has fractured this world. Life is going to punch you in the face. It just is. There are trials, there are various trials, there are things that happen, and some of you I know beyond a shadow of a doubt are going through a trial right now. Probably multiple trials. My encouragement to you is that we would keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. We would use, I know it's easier said than done. 
but we would use these trials as an opportunity to grow in our relationship with the Lord and we would keep our eyes fixed on him. There's this passage in Hebrews chapter 11. It's called the Hall of Faith. And if you have never read Hebrews chapter 11, I would encourage you to read it this afternoon. It's basically person after person after person who persevered. It's person after person after person who had great faith. And it, I mean, it goes through, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Noah building an ark. Like they, all these people did stuff on faith. Noah building an ark. I mean, how crazy does that sound? But he did it on faith. Like that, that's, the, that's what the, this writer is describing. And it's, it basically, it's not everything turned out well. Some of these people got sawed in two, but they had faith. And so then in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer, here's what the writer says. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, basically everybody in Hebrews 11, let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Now listen to this part. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary and faint hearted. If you want an example of somebody who endured, if you want an example of somebody who had joy, of somebody who persevered in trials, the author is saying, look to Jesus because he is the founder and perfecter of our faith. But the, the, the part of that verse that stands out the most is, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. How do you endure the cross with joy? Because you know one day you're going to be seated at the right hand of God. E even the cross is joy when God is the goal. And my challenge to you this morning is just to keep your eyes on Jesus. And maybe there's someone here today and you're like, look, I, I know a lot about God. I've heard a lot about God. I've been to church many times. Between you and me, none of that is relevant right now. My, my question for some of you today is I remember sitting in your shoes, and if I was honest, I'd never given my life to Jesus. I came to church. I knew, I knew some of the answers but I'd never actually committed my life to Christ. And if that's you today and you're sitting here like, you know what, I've never actually confessed my sins. I've never kind of thrown myself at the feet of Jesus. I just pray that today is the day that happens. Romans 10 says it like this, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I was reading a story a few weeks ago about uh, a group of people out in Arizona. It was this experiment that took place in Arizona in the early 90s. And apparently there were these two scientists that came together. They raised a bunch of money, millions and millions of dollars. And they wanted to build what was called a biosphere. Has anybody heard of this? It still exists today. They wanted to build this biosphere. And the plan was for eight scientists. Here's a picture of what it looks like. The plan was for eight scientists to live inside this dome located in Oracle, Arizona for two years. And then it was a completely closed ecosystem. And so the goal was for them to learn about the earth, learn about how things interacted. They were going to grow all their own food. They were going to eat all their own food. They were going to never have any contact with the outside world. I don't know if eventually they were trying to figure out if we could live on other planets. I don't know the ultimate goal. But they were just trying to figure out if they could. And so each of those domes is a, little, is a different micro-environment. They had a savanna in there. They had a desert in there. They had a rainforest in there. They even had a little ocean. Little ocean in there. But one of the most fascinating aspects of the experiment was the trees. So they, they had these trees, it was, and it fascinated all the scientists to see how this worked, but they, they planted obviously all these things, and they said the trees grew so much quicker than the exact same trees outside the biosphere. They, they would grow, they'd come to these you know, pretty decent heights, and they would go up really incredible pace, and they would go all the way up. But the, things that baff, the thing that baffled scientists is they said all the trees, when they hit a certain height, they fell over. And it took them so long to figure out why, but what they discovered is they lacked one critical element, wind. They said without wind, the roots of the tree 
did not grow and get as strong as they needed to grow. And they said the wood inside the bark that kind of protects the tree from falling over didn't grow as strong as it grew outside of the, outside of the dome. And they were fascinated by the idea that they would grow fast and without roots, they would fall over. I love the, the picture that that gives us. I assume you see where this is going because I think if we're honest, we'd all like to live maybe not in there, but we'd all love to live in a controlled environment. Would we not? We don't want trials. We don't want things to happen. We don't want issues to come our way. I don't want all these hurricanes and storms and family issues and family crises. If I could live in a little bubble all day long, most of us would be like, give me the bubble. As long as there's my, my hobbies and things I like to do and good food, give me the bubble. The reality is, it's the stress and it's the wind and the trials that grow us. Those are the things, whether we like them or not, that connect us more to Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. We are just amazed at how your word comes together, amazed by these just how blunt the book of James is and, Lord, the things we can study. Lord, I don't think there's anybody in this room who loves a trial. Lord, but I just pray that today we would maybe look at them a little bit differently. That we would recognize that when a trial comes, not to say we have a fake smile on our face and we act like everything's good. Obviously, it's not. But, Lord, we would recognize what we are. We would consider what you're doing. Because, obviously, they are an opportunity for us to get closer to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And it's in your name. Amen.